We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder. One subject that we take a special interest in is cold cases. Murder cases that, for whatever reason, simply do not get solved. Denying families of victims an opportunity to get justice for their loved ones. That's why we paid particular attention when we learned that Michael Arntfield had just published a book on the subject, How to Solve a Cold Case, and everything else you wanted to know about catching killers. Arntfield has impressive credentials to write about this subject. A former police officer and detective, he now serves as a professor at the University of Western Ontario. There, he founded the Western Cold Case Society. In addition to all of that, he has written a string of wonderful books and has made appearances on a number of television programs. His newest book, which again is How to Solve a Cold Case and Everything Else You Wanted to Know About Catching Killers, not only discusses several interesting cases, but also offers a deep dive on just what a cold case is and why so many cases just don't get solved. It is a terrific read, and we were delighted that Arntfield agreed to take time to talk about it with us. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is a conversation with Michael Arnfield about how to solve cold cases. I want to say we really enjoyed your book, and we're looking forward to uh, discussing it with you. You already made it all the way through? Uh, I have. I finished it uh, uh, this uh, this afternoon. We're fast readers. I've, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm getting good feedback. Uh, this is the, the longest writing process I've ever had to endure. I, got, I started writing that book in like 2018, and there's a pandemic, and there's been a ton of changes, new editors. So I'm compared to my other works, pretty divorced from it. Like I just, I've lost all perspective on whether it's good or not. <laughs> People are reminding me with questions what's actually in it just because I, I was just sort of sight reading it at the end. <laughs> well, we both really enjoyed it. Speaking of the end of the book, there's a section there where you talk about uh, the true crime industry and you say a lot of justifiably harsh things about <laughs> true crime. Very justifiably in our view. <laughs> about programs like uh, Serial. I, I think... Uh, let me read exactly what you said. You said serial is uh, interpolation, confabulation, and exaggeration. But then at the very end of your book, you conclude by saying that true crime, now more than ever, is the best mechanism to offer opportunities for the public to become engaged. And so I, I was just wondering how you could uh, reconcile uh, your criticisms of true crime with also uh, the potential of true crime to help solve some of these cases. Right. So uh, I single out a couple um, production that certainly stoked the public interest. And uh, basically the, the messaging there is, um, you know, the, the end can justify the mean. Uh, some of these productions, again, are needlessly salacious. Um, and in fact, we really have a, uh, I would say, a two-tiered uh, true crime system now and what I've Theorizes the fourth wave of true crime since basically the 1850s. And uh, so you've got these very um, salacious, offender lionizing, sort of <sighs> paltry in terms of the, their investigative work production. Uh, and then you have other ones um, you know, that I've, I try to pride myself on being attached to the latter, which is um, ones that are didactic, the ones that, that can provide instruction and inspiration for people to either get into these fields uh, or to do what they can to help out, whether it be, um, again, researching um, new innovative methods or, or, or just, um, you know, offering discussion and, uh, or as reporters or podcasters, keeping cases in the public eye, keeping pressure on offenders and on investigators to keep these cases, to keep momentum going. So it's the, this interactive um, again, didactic. So there's a, a factual or moral lesson that can be drawn out of some of the more important ones. Um, and it's, it's those two things that distinguish the current way that we're in and why I think, um, you know, it, it can potentially help cold cases. I mean, someone's interest in true crime a few years ago in cold cases led to um, the innovations in what are, we're now calling genomics, which I talk about in the book, so forensic genealogy. And, I mean, there's a firm in, in Texas, there's a few private companies doing this, but there's a firm in Texas basically solving two to three cases a week. And we're living in a time when, in theory, every case ever where there is a fraction of DNA that can be recovered using modern standards, all of those cases are now solvable. I was really struck reading the book how many instances you were able to cite, in fact, when cases were able to be solved by other than police. You talked about uh, Paul Hulls, for instance, with the uh, Golden State Killer, and you had many other cases much less well-known than that. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, an interesting case from Pennsylvania in there. I don't want to necessarily spoil it, but I mean, um, the Pennsylvania State Police basically have, their cold case you know, has, has a couple people whose sole job is to just brainstorm and think outside the box of new ways of looking at cases that don't have DNA. And, I mean, this, this case turned on a dime years later when basically the, the detective goes to a photography professor. And it turns out that uh, some things could be done with the crime scene photo and the, the offender died before he could go on trial. And it, but that's the other thing I, I talk about in the, in the book is DNA is great. We have genomics now that, that can, you know, this is a massive quantum leap forward in terms of uh, criminalistics. But a lot of cool cases, and this is where civilians can come in and, and people in other fields, are solved circumstantially. 
And I talked again about the cold case squad in, in Nashville, which is sort of like the 1927 New York Yankees of, of cold case squads. I mean, they were building out cases with no bodies found and they could circumstantially put them together. Uh, and, uh, you can meet proof beyond a reasonable doubt through circumstance. Um, most evidence is circumstantial. Alibis are circumstantial. Fingerprints are technically circumstantial. So circumstantial evidence is it's sort of become a, a dirty word, I think, in the mind of some people. But uh, for years, and still currently, some most crime will get solved. Yeah, I was actually surprised by some of your comments about uh, DNA evidence in your book. You say that uh, DNA is used as a crutch to the exclusion of other tried and true methods that might break a case. Exactly. And, uh, well, at least in terms of prioritizing cases. So there's a reason the solved rate has been declining steadily and uh, actually bottomed out to record levels in 2020. Resources provided to police, including homicide units, uh, especially cold case units, which are are really a rarity, they've been deteriorating and becoming less and less, uh, you know, Austerity measures, uh, you know, the defunding, which never happened, but it led to a realigning of where money went. And cold case squads were um, sort of left with their hand out. So, um, yeah, as a matter of just uh, trying to keep the solid rate above 50 percent, investigators will often rely on those cases with DNA, focus on those first and, you know, save the others for a rainy day, when in reality, the cases often without DNA uh, are the ones where we've got, you know, emerging serial offenders uh, or just are the cases that, you know, you sign up to be a cop for and they, they unfortunately don't get to do the light of day just because of the low-hanging fruit having to take priority as an operational necessity. One thing you wrote about that kind of hit home with me, uh, I happen to be uh, an attorney who represents the sister of a victim in a case, a case you actually mentioned in your book, the Burger Chef murder case. And in that case, the police files are being held by the police and they're not allowing access to anyone else except for one favored podcaster. And in your book, you write that the, the police department being able to maintain exclusive access just is becoming increasingly antithetical to what most people now consider justice for past wrongs. And you talk about a Homicide Victims Families Rights Act, which I found very intriguing. Can you tell us about that? Right, so the Homicide Victims Families Rights Act uh, was a draft bill that uh, my group, the Murder Accountability Project, a nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C., Metro D.C., by virtue of the work we're doing and, and it, our location there was brought to um, a couple of Congress people, uh, one a Democrat, one a Republican, and there was bipartisan interest in doing it. Basically that, you know, we would come up with, it, 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 it sort of is no longer viable. We would have to reapply under the, the new administration. But uh, at the time, in draft form, basically we had a, a list of criteria. It was, I think, um, you know, if a case is unresolved after 10 years, the family can lobby, basically, and there would be a process. You basically would bring a motion uh, if there wasn't otherwise on consent. Uh, and the be a, a, a sort of legal process that would allow actions to be made under that act to release, not to strip the police necessarily of jurisdiction, but to allow a number or any one of a number of vetted approved agencies, whether it be a law firm, whether it be our group, the My Accountability Project, whether it be the VDOC Society, which is a, uh, largely law enforcement, but it's uh, half civilian, half law enforcement think tank in, in Philadelphia, um, that's, or whether it just be the state police that just happened in the city, that statistically state police actually have the highest solve rate of all police department types. So it would allow that, that basically, why are you jealously guarding this case and offering platitudes to the evening news saying no case is ever cold or still tirelessly working this? We know you're not. Let's give it to somebody who's interested and who can renew momentum. And at the end of the day, if it gets somewhere, you're still going to be able to, to get in on the win. Obviously, this person's going to have to be taken into custody in your jurisdiction and you'd have to be co-leads on the investigation. 
why wouldn't you want to lighten the load, spread it around, have expertise that's coming to you, you don't need to seek it out, and democratize the case and, and go from there. I mean, to go back to these genomic labs, the number of criminal investigators I talked to, I mentioned the names of these labs in uh, Ostrom and Parabon and others, uh, and they haven't even heard of them. Well, some of these labs are, you know, have law enforcement liaison that will go and are aware of cases and jurisdictions that will sort of nudge them and ask them to submit to these labs. But most of the time, it's a, it's a single enterprising investigator who, like, like Paul Holes, that case started when Paul Holes was still on the job uh, in terms of his referring it to for a genomic test. And so what if you had someone who could broker that, who would say, okay, the family has the means, maybe he needs to pay for this privately. And seal the file, provide access to the sample, uh, and for the few thousand dollars that it costs, they can broker through legal counsel, probably, like in your circumstance, they can broker the test, and the case could be solved, you know, 20 years later, probably in a matter of months. To me, it just makes sense. What's been the uh, reaction you've gotten, uh, you know, that your team has gotten to that sort of proposed legislation? Is there... I mean, is law enforcement generally seem, seeming amenable, or have you gotten pushback? Law enforcement in general is amenable to the work we're doing across the board. So most of our board of directors, actually half and half, half would be sort of investigative journalists or scientists generally, and half would be either current or former or law enforcement. Uh, so we just added the current NYPD uh, detective sergeant um, who's now on our board and then sort of uh, another bridge to law enforcement, but we routinely speak at, at law enforcement conferences, the FBI Academy, uh, what have you, and there's the odd person who sort of gets the nose out of joint, but by and large, if you're aware of our group, you're interested in cold cases, and you're in law enforcement, you're, those are the types of people who I end up working with. The people who are phoning it in and sort of don't like um, outsider input or backseat drivers on cases, they don't know about because or about the work we're doing, and so they don't have an opinion because they're not engaged enough to even care. I'm someone, I always have a trouble uh, understanding statistics and such, and you write a lot about statistics, and you also write about how the Murder Accountability Project is able to use statistics to actually discover serial killers operating that the public and the police had no idea even existed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I would like to, statistics are usually uh, misleading, uh, lack context, and are pretty boring, but I'd like to think that we've found statistics or statistical patterns and anomalies that that, uh, are really remarkable. And what you're talking about, so we've done a number of statistically-based empirical studies uh, but what you're talking about is actually the next level, which is we took those statistics uh, and then we programmed an algorithm that looks for, based on the statistical patterns we were seeing, uh, will automatically look for patterns in cities, so census metropolitan areas, so not just single city, but whatever towns or exurbs fall within that census metropolitan area for census purposes. And we'll look for two or more cases bearing basic similarities. So this is a really stripped-down, simplified version of the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, which the FBI has been running for years. Uh, Police departments submit on a voluntary basis basically all the characteristics of a crime that goes into a massive supercomputer and compares it to other crimes. Well, they have hundreds of criteria uh, that makes making matches very difficult because there's so many criteria that have to be the same. Whereas we based our algorithm that finds connections between crimes digitally uh, more simple and, and relied on, on, on basic um, case level information. Age of the victim, ethnicity of the victim, cause of death, apparent motive, and of course, time. So we look at crimes, and there's, there needs to just be two or more for it to classify as a, as a serial crime. We look at cases that cluster in time and space in the same census metropolitan area where there are, and you can, we can set the, the algorithm to either look at male victims, female victims, a specific age range, but just in general, uh, when you have two or more 
female victims strangled during, uh, let's say, a single year or, or even two years in the same metropolitan area, and they are unsolved because we have the full list of all unsolved and solved homicides going back to the 70s. And actually, you're far more beyond that. But the, the algorithm can only run uh, cases basically from the late 70s onwards. And it's rooted in a very simple principle, which is that the vast majority, statistically, of offenders, murderers, who strangle female victims, get caught quickly. And that's because these are domestic homicides. Uh, they're either called at the scene, uh, so the neighbors call in a domestic disturbance, or they're arrested shortly thereafter. And cases are, are, are open and shut for the most part. So when you have two or more that go unsolved, because it's not uh, you know, ex-boyfriend or husband or, or, or someone, and as a stranger, then you've got a you know you've got a problem because um, a this person uh, seems to have no logical connection to the victim, so they may be a stranger to them. And we also know that serial offenders employ a number of uh, of methods of murder, but the vast majority, and this comes from offender interviews uh, as well as just statistics like to include strangulation either, either as a cause of death or a contributing cause of death. So we have the preferred method of murder among serial killers as the modus operandi. We have a connection between the victim and the killer that would appear that they do not know them. They may be a, a targeted or stock stranger or just a, a completely random stranger attacked at random. Uh, and then we have two or more which classifies the pattern of the serial pattern. So we deploy this algorithm, it's running always in the background, and it just identifies, um, again, it, it will ping on, and you can actually pull it up on a map, and there's a, and there's a, a photo of all the current all the current uh, hits that the algorithm is making coast to coast in the U.S. in the book, and, and go from there. And could it be a false positive, and yeah, we have two random incidents that are unrelated? Yeah, that happens, uh, but uh, how about Chicago, where you've got 51 of these? over this course of 15 years. So that was one of the ones along with Gary, Indiana, and, and, and Cleveland, Ohio, that we immediately brought uh, to law enforcement attention. In Cleveland, they formed a task force, quickly made an arrest. Uh, there's been no similar murders since, even though he was only arrested for one crime. In Gary, Indiana, they said, oh, this is young science, uh, and then and ignored us, and the, the murders continued until... Karen Dion Van was arrested in a neighboring city and then confessed to the other murder back in Gary. So uh, our our software knew about Darren Dion Van, didn't know his name, but recognized in the data his murder uh, years before he confessed and other victims would have been, I think, you know, saved had the police listened. And the police had listened in Chicago and there was recently a, a docu-series on uh, investigation discovery featuring our work and, and what the police are doing about that pattern of this one in Chicago. This is, it's all very fascinating. Uh, would you argue that a substantial number or percentage of uh, cold cases are actually the work of serial killers operating beneath the radar? That's a good question. And I don't know if it would, it would be most of those, but I would say a substantial number of those, particularly with... In, cases where there's a, a recurring ammo that we know is preferred among serial killers. So, um, I mean, let's go back to Chicago, you know, that has like 18 shootings a weekend. Some are fatal, some aren't. Um, I mean, many of those homicides will go cold. Will that person shoot at somebody else again? Um, maybe. Uh, you know, if they do and they're successful again and get away with it again, that they're technically a serial killer, two separate victims in two separate places at two separate times. But uh, we do, the short answer is we don't really know. And, and, and that's because, and as I explained in the book, we are really trying to clean up uh, and get firm numbers on homicide for the first time in the U.S. ever. There's a number of, for years, agencies were never submitting their, their, their homicide data to the FBI. So the annual published reports were really more estimates because there was just black holes all over the country, missing, missing links. And we, we've gone to those places and, and got their data at source and then added it to the federal data to, to fill in the blanks. But we also know that misclassified or concealed homicides are still a huge issue. Um, and we, we did a study on that too, looking at CDC 
death certificates from homicide versus all the homicides reported to the FBI by police departments or that we find by going to these smaller agencies that don't report to the FBI. And there's consistently a shortfall of about 2,500 a year, whereby there's 2,500 more deaths from homicide showing up at, at the CDC than at the FBI. So where are those cases going? The police have classified them as accident, suicide, misadventure, undetermined, where the medical professional has later said, now oh, the person was killed intentionally by another person. So, uh, and the records never get reconciled and married up. Yeah, I found that, uh, frankly, a little surprising. Uh, you're, you're talking about concealed homicides. It never occurred to me that one reason why a lot of murders go cold is because they're not really seen or recognized as murders. And you talked a little bit there about concealed homicides. You also indicated there was another category called the missing missing. Can you uh, tell us what that means? So the, you know, the missing missing. So a concealed homicide is basically a, a murder missing from police records because it got miscoded through a bad judgment call early on in the crime. Uh, it was sort of written off at face value as something else. Uh, so that's a murder that never gets properly investigated. The missing missing as a whole other category of person, uh, a victim who is so on the margins and, and so really alienated from what we would consider conventional life that when something happens to them, they're abducted, kidnapped, um, or just killed and their body concealed. Nobody notices their absence. So nobody is there to report to the police that this person is missing. So they are missing. They've been removed from their life, either to a specific place where they're held or they're, they've been uh, they've been murdered, uh, and their body hasn't been found yet. Uh, but nobody's looking for them. So there's no way beyond, I mean, making some sort of guesstimate that we know how many of these people are out there. I mean, uh, if you think about the, the thousands of unidentified remains that, that are on the books uh, in the U.S. That, and these are these are missing missing whose bodies have been found. Well, we don't know who they are because there's no missing persons record to, to match it up to. These are bodies that have just materialized, many of them homicide victims. Uh, but we have no idea who they are, what their last moments were like, who their family is, where they're from. So those are just the bodies we found. How many thousands or tens of thousands are out there still waiting to be found? Never reported missing, so nobody's looking for who took them. And the case I, I use in the book is absolutely chilling, uh, which is, and, and I know the investigators on this case, uh, it, it, it's not a homeless drug addict uh, or, you know, who is um, in the sex trade. It, it's uh, a middle-aged, if professionally employed woman and her teenage daughter who don't become the missing missing from their own home. So... People with jobs, people with friends, people with sports teams, people with dentists and doctors. Nobody noticed or did anything about it until basically the, the son of the family gets out of jail and goes and knocks on the door and somebody else is living in the house. And then he starts to put it together. Had he been estranged from the family, done more time, it was an impaired driving case, you know, and the trail gone cold, they'd still be the missing missing and the killer out there and, and, and certainly actually uh, the undercover operation used to find the killer there's evidence that you know he had moved to another city and was planning on doing the whole thing again yeah that story truly was chilling it was like something out of the twilight zone uh when you write yeah. about cold case investigations uh you, you came up with a very memorable uh comparison you said that the modern cold case investigator is a bit like marty mcfly from back to the future and i was wondering if you could explain what you meant by that yeah, I, uh, as I say, you have to be one part criminal investigator, one part time, time traveler. Um, so yeah, Marty McFly, or Kyle Reese from The Terminator for that matter. I mean, you need to go back in time, and you really do when you go down the rabbit hole of, of these cases. And, and you, you need to, and again, this is, I'm talking sort of metaphorically here, but you, you need to operate convincingly within that time and understand the limitations of that time. Um, and I mean, so the whole thing and, in, in the motion pictures is, you know, they don't want to be, um, they don't want to blow their mission basically, or they don't want to be found out and, you know, that they're from the future or other than to some select people. 
whereas the, the, the peril in the case of the, the sort of cocky investigator who wants to go back 40 years and, and solve a crime is that if you don't come at it with the same sort of measured, careful way of being able to understand how to operate in that time, you're going to miss things. You're going to miss things and, and, and you will blow the mission. So the idea is that you may have all the sensibilities of the present or the future, uh, but you need to strip that down and, and, and liberate yourself to, to live and work within and think within and analyze within um, the limitations of the period, limitations of the police and also limitations of the offender. And this is where I think, looking back at some of these cases and a couple of are explored in the book, understand that offenders are going to make different mistakes in the 60s than they might today. Um, and also uh, that those mistakes and this is where the, the benefit of being from the future can come in handy. Those mistakes can end up actually, when you put your 2022 hat back on after you jumped into the case, uh, be very helpful. And I gave the example of genomics. And this, uh, I can think of a case, it's not in the book, but um, that we focused on on one of my television series. And we suggested to the police, you know what, this was 1986. This woman was attacked outside. We pulled the meteor meteorological records, and uh, it was incredibly humid, incredibly violent death, violent struggle. Uh, and we said, test the ligature. That they still had an evidence. So they would lost better DNA evidence. I'll just leave it at that. But what they did have was the ligature used. And uh, if you're reefing on this outside with adrenaline going, you, there was going to be skin and sweat still on that ligature decades later. And they tested it, and when DNA first started in 1999, they couldn't test for that, but they can now. So his carelessness in 1986, and this is where time is sort of on the, the investigator's side, technology caught up with his mistake. And we still don't have a match using CODIS, the combined DNA index system, the, the law enforcement database. But this is one of the, the cases I've strongly advocated be sent to Awesome or one of the other labs, because there's no question the brutality of this case is person is killed elsewhere. And, it may still be alive in either way. We didn't know who it was. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, in terms of cold case units being kind of continuing to be a rarity. Um, and, and I was wondering if you could speak more to that. On the one hand, it seems like there's a lot of public interest in some of these cold cases getting solved. But then it seems like de uh, units dedicated to that mission remain somewhat rare. And I guess what, what, in, what in your opinion is behind that sort of disconnect? It's strictly resources. I mean, uh, uh, again, when you look at large cities, and we know the homicide rate uh, has surged in the last couple of years and stalled rates going down. So you have really a perfect storm that is overwhelming homicide units, which, despite what you see on TV, are bureaucracies, competitive bureaucracies. There's politics and egos involved and budgets and not unlimited money and uh, problem personalities and everything else is not, uh, again, not as seen on TV. So when you're running at full capacity and they're already over budget, uh, you know, just to keep up with current crime, uh, there's zero bandwidth left to have boutique uh, units that just investigate cold cases. And that's why, with the, you know, there's a, there's a, I go back to the national case now and again, and I want to come back to that because connects to the Burger Chef murder. I think I think I may have put that in the book. But they started basically as a secret society they, because of personal interest. And people with interest in cold cases started, you know, keeping them as pet projects, looking into them. Then they got the DA involved, so they had like a designated uh, prosecutor who could sort of look at these and, and tell them where to go with it. And, and it was all, I mean, being done basically as a hobby unit initially. And then, of course, as I, I mentioned in, in the book, a lot of these units get formed when money gets freed up from another area or when, when there's some kind of grant, government grant involved. But other than that, I mean, the number of, of police departments that can still sustain uh, a small cold case unit is, is, is very small. And a lot, a lot of investigators, good investigators, um, will keep revisiting these cases. Uh, but they often do it on their own time or they do it, you know, the three hours a week that they don't have to be in court or they're not working on the search warrants on other current cases. So, um, 
and unfortunately, it's just a matter of, of um, bandwidth. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the rising homicide rate and then the plummeting solve rate, and I thought you really summed it up well in the book. You know, talking about how those numbers can be a real clear indicator about the health of a city or a jurisdiction or whatnot. And um, could you speak more to that? Yeah, I mean, the solved rate, well, first of all, the, the, the homicide rate for 100,000 and then the, the solved rate are, are two microcosms of what life is like in that in that city generally, we found. Uh, if you have soaring crime rates, or homicide rates can be circumstantial, uh, that's situational. Uh, there are certain things that cities with rising murder rates have in common that I don't necessarily want to advertise. Um, but when you see, yeah, plummeting sol- or, or, or consistently low solid rates, you're talking about a police department that either has a human resource problem or a financial resource problem involving the one area of quality of life con- that concerns 100% of people, which is not being a victim of violence and, and not and staying alive. So if that's what's happening there in, in that respect, again, so I look at cities like Flint, yeah, what's your infrastructure look like? What's your garbage collection system look like? What do your schools look like? What does your health care look like? What do your roads look like? It's, again, a good surface indicator and that maybe this, this is a place, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just take the transfer to, to Denver instead of the promotion in, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So I recommend to people, I mean, it's not going to necessarily determine where they want to lay down roots, but not a lot of people think about this. So, yeah, you take a promotion, you're going to move to this city to live with this person, go to murderdata.org, pull up the city uh, and, and county even. Uh, first of all, see if there's any suspected serial killers there. Uh, and two, look at this clearance rate or the solved rate for the police department of jurisdiction and ask yourself, okay, um, if they are only solving 35% of murders, uh, and there's really not that many murders, but they're solving that few of them. Uh, are they properly staffed? If they're not properly staffed, is the fire department properly staffed? Is the fire your house? Or are you going to be able to get someone there to save it or get you out? Are the schools properly funded? Again, quality of life concerns that boil down to, um, or, or, or that you're never going to get all the, all the answers on. You're not going to call around. And, I mean, you could go there and, knock on doors and ask people but that's a simple statistic that can really speak for itself in terms of the livability of the city yeah it's a, it's a no, it's an enormous barometer um and and uh yeah and and i guess you know that's you kind of talking about how people can maybe take that into their own hands by by looking up um areas they may want to live uh i guess what other advice would you have for folks who listen to true crime podcasts like ours and, and, you know, read books like yours. And, you know, if they're interested in these topics and perhaps want to, um, you know, push for change, push for higher solve rates, push for more resources being given to cold cases and push for um, legislation like the ones that uh, you guys were trying to introduce. um, How can they kind of get involved and how can they sort of put that, you know, into their own lives? Well, in the United States, uh, so I'm in Canada, and I would say in Canada, you're basically SOL. What will happen will happen. Um, there is zero government engagement other than really, I mean, I think the Wall Street Journal summed it up when they referred to Canada as no longer the, the, um, nice, polite next door neighbor. They refer to it as a bureaucratic dystopia of Orwellian nature, and they're right. In the U.S., Every citizen can, can make a difference uh, through the ballot box. Uh, most positions in Canada that are appointments in the U.S. require election, and those people can be recalled if they, they screw up. So police chiefs and commissioners, DAs, judges, uh, these are all appointments here. Whereas in America, um, you know, on top of those people, then you've got you know your, your congressperson, you've got your representative. You've got the sheriff. You've got all kinds of people. Uh, it's a meritocracy still. So you want to change things, you know, uh, think about uh, what type of political machine you are prepared to support or what candidates you are prepared to support who believe in these things. 
because a lot of them don't. And uh, the problems I'm, I've been discussing, so resources and understaffing and uh, budgets being clawed back. And so, you know, you got to borrow from one unit just to keep the lights off, or much less, you know, have to be able to start a cold case squad or uh, give more funding to uh, crime and addiction and prevention. Those are all the distillation of political decisions made by people who are elected. You want to change things, change who the decision makers are. And that's something every person over 21 in the U.S. can do. So do your research. Be an informed uh, informed voter. What is, what is this? And we're, we're seeing the decay of some great American cities because people haven't done that. Or they're, they're, they're voting ideologically rather than logically and with any degree of, of public safety in mind. So, yeah, what is your perspective, DA's? A record on um, a conviction record. Uh, what's his position on certain types of, of crimes? Which is what this judge is up for re-election? And what's his or her position on sentencing uh, guidelines? Um, you know, mayors. I can tell you, and I'm, I don't want to get too political here, but mayors, the cities that have the consistently worst clearance rates, uh, their mayors all have common characteristics, and I'll just leave it at that. But the, whoever the mayor is in, in the U.S., the relationship between the mayor, the police commissioner, uh, and, uh, again, other um, VA, other law enforcement uh, entities, uh, while well, the mayor is sort of, the, the, I don't want to say token position, but uh, a largely symbolic position, they have a lot of sway on these agents. So mayors can really screw things up in a hurry. So, again, I would, I would think very... Uh, I care about who you vote for from there if you're a problem. Second the thing that people can do, and this is in the book, regardless of what your stance is on it, um, if it's within your means, uh, and if it's not, ask for it for Christmas. Uh, get a get a um, genetic test done. Get a, a, a family DNA test done. And upload it to GD Match or the other open source sites to get it out there. You could be descended from or peripherally connected to a relative you've never met uh, whose DNA is out of, is out of cold case. Um, this whole genomics revolution, it, 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 the science is changing by the day because the samples are, are, are growing. So the, the links in the chain from the crime scene DNA sample to the family tree that produced the offender uh, are, are, are getting shorter. And the more samples that are out there, the more quickly we can narrow down the haystack to find the needle. And there's just more samples to draw from. There's more, there's more interconnections for uh, these analysts at these labs uh, to find and then turn over the long book. Um, and I wanted to ask you about a few moments in the books, uh, in, in the book that we kind of um, stuck with us. And, and one was, you mentioned that your ancestor was... Uh, had some sort of criminal history in Ireland. My family's from Ireland. My grandparents are from Dublin and Westmeath. So I was just curious if you could tell us more about that. Yeah. So first of all, I could tell you Irish just from, obviously your name is Gaelic. <laughs> I saw, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I, I got to mention that. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, he's a dis- not too distant relative. Um, he's a great, great, great uncle um, who was, um, in, so I was well outside Dublin in, in Bally Bay, which is up actually here, the, the northern border. Um, and he was responsible for several and tried for and acquitted for several murders that we're aware of. But local lore is that he, he owned a um, the pub in town uh, and that subsequent to uh, his incarceration and then actually after his death, that a, a number of we don't necessarily know the relationship, but believed to be political or business rivals were found walled up in the basement of the pub. Uh, so, I mean, he was a serial killer conf- confirmed just from the murders he committed as a as both a pub owner and the chief of police, which is an interesting combination, but obviously no big deal back then. This is like late 19th century. So we're, we're aware of at least three murders. And then this, this whole story about the, the body that what was known locally as the black hole. You didn't want to end up uh, with him alone in the, the basement of this place. Whether that's lore or, 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 or not, um, we'll, I guess we'll never know. 
I think that's your next book. I mean, it's the Ireland's Cask of Amontillado. That, I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, it's and, and not, obviously not widely known, but again, this is, I, I've got my own stuff, or podcast called Suspect Zero, which looks at, um, because this fourth wave of true crime just has the same greatest hits over and over again. It's always Ted Bundy or Ramirez or one of the same, you know, sort of group of seven. I My podcast focuses on what, uh, you know, if this was a music, those are the greatest hits. I, I look at deep cuts and B-sides, lesser known suspects with zero name recognition, but whose importance has somehow been overlooked because the cases are just so extraordinarily disturbing or so critical to our understanding of offender profiling uh, and were sort of precedent-setting cases in terms of investigative methods, and yet nobody knows about them because they're too busy just trying to get the next Ted Bundy special on, as though this is like breaking news. So, yeah, that's uh, we haven't done one on Sam Gray yet, but that that is sort of why I, I've featured it in, in the book. Yeah, absolutely, and definitely hear you on the kind of popular hits getting recycled so often that they kind of just become meaningless or, you know, cliched. Yeah. Um, one, one, one case that Kevin and I have covered, Kevin mentioned he represents the sister of one of the victims, is, is Burger Chef, and that's one that sort of started off as a deep cut. And then I think over the last few years, it's gotten some more mainstream attention. But we enjoyed the the kind of insight that you uh, put in your book on that, sort of saying maybe there's a Paul Dennis Reed connection. That's that's something we've right. heard a few times. And we were wondering if you could tell us anything more about what, you know, your conversations with one of the original detectives were like and sort of how you came to that, uh, you know, thought process. Yeah, so I, oh, another one of my books, uh, Monster City, Murder, Music, and Mayhem in Nashville's Dark Age, looks at, I've already talked about them, the iconic Nashville Cold Case Squad. That, um, I mean, so I lived in Nashville for, for some time. I was a visiting, visiting professor at Vanderbilt and ran on some ride-alongs with Metro Police there. And I mean, it's, it's now it's like Las Vegas, basically. But, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, the cases there, serial killers, mass murder, were just crazy. And this cold case squad basically tackled them all. So basically, long story short, a detective, a, a former Indiana State Police detective, uh, read the book uh, and emailed me and said, after he read the, the atrocities committed by Paul Dennis Reed, who was an aspiring country artist, moved to Nashville with delusions of being in the industry, even though he didn't play an instrument, had some talent. Uh, and then his plan B was just massacring entire workplaces, usually restaurants, and fast food joints, uh, and killing all the teenage staff and then robbing the place of just like basically pennies on the dollar. And it was never about the money. It was, it was, it was an absolute psychopath. So, I mean, he, he slaughtered kids working at McDonald's at a, at a 31 Flavors, uh, at a Shoney's, which is sort of a, a southern chain, a, a bunch of other places. Uh, and we know then also his earlier crime, uh, he was convicted of, of robbing a, a, a Houston steakhouse. No one was killed in that, uh, but by sheer luck. So these types of crimes are very rare. These takeover robberies where the offender is not deterred by there being multiple employees or cameras, whatever, uh, and everybody's slaughtered. So the detective read this and he said, you know if Paul Dennis Reed's movements ever took him uh to Indiana, and we know he's out of custody around the time of the Burger Chef murders. There are major similarities between that crime as well as, and I forgot to mention, uh, Reed is also the prime suspect in uh, uh, slaughter at a, at a Texas bowling alley, where again, all the teenager employees before opening were basically lined up and shot execution style for no apparent reason other than he, Reed was thrown out of there. Uh, for being drunk two nights earlier, so he just went back for revenge. That's sort of where he went from just robbing places to, to, to massacring everybody there. And he, somebody else was actually put on death row for that and wrongfully convicted. And Reed is sort of then in the wind for the next few years, and that's when Burger Chef happened. So, I mean, for sure he has to be considered. Um, could it be entirely ran? Could it be, you know, a crew? Uh, maybe. It just seems... It has the, the same insanely cruel verb to it as his crime. Yeah, absolutely. The senselessness of the violence and 
and the, yeah. the take was like a little bit over 500 bucks. So no, I mean, nothing. I mean, obviously not lives aren't worth any money, obviously, but the level of violence kind of that happened when it seemed like all the kids in the burger chef case were complying. Uh, it's just kind of outrageous. Yeah. And uh, I'll stress that real and it's real armed robbers who are financially motivated, do not want to things to get messy and to hurt people Like if you're there for the money. So if you're not there for the money, and I talk a bit, a bit about this in the book in terms of recognizing the actual motive. I mean, so to go to quickly to Richard Ramirez and, and, and the Golden State Killer, uh, I mean, stuff was taken in all those home invasion murders as well. Meeting this stuff, you usually found discarded later. And unfortunately, investigators in those cases zeroed in on this, this stuff's missing... Uh, the fine china is missing. This was a robbery gone bad. Uh, not there for the whatever trinkets that, that, he, that he took just to justify being there and, and more likely taken as a souvenir. So, I mean, when you see these, these types of uh, workplace massacres for a pittance in terms of the, the take, this is not a professional who scouted the place, knows there's going to be money there, is wrong and doesn't want to leave witnesses. This is someone, a sadist who is there to kill and the money is, is just afterthought well that kind of goes through all of our questions i i wanted to open it back up to you and just ask is there anything that we didn't ask about that you wanted to mention or you think it's important to to stress no i think you, you both obviously done a close reading of the book and I, I i i like what uh what you think has stood out and, and what your listeners would be would be interested in in terms of just a, a quick breakdown here on the show and, and to go to buy the book, great. I'll just actually ask you a question because I have a section, as you know, on cold cases that's officially still on the books. I think we can, based on our body of knowledge that we now have in terms of why offenders do what they do and who was where, what time, we can reasonably be solved. At least the historical record, the oral history can deem it solved. So the one was, um, if, you were, if you remember, the massacre of 45 people on a uh, Canadian prop plane back in 1965. Do you remember that case? Yeah, that was very intriguing. It was amazing how there were there were four very good suspects for that crime <laughs> on the flight. That was incredible. Yeah, and um, it, it, explaining that in a simple manner was was, was difficult, but. Uh, the likelihood of these four passengers, unknown to each other, all being on the same flight, uh, when police later dug into their lives, I mean, any one of them could have, I mean, they all had, they all took out insurance right before, there was, the plane was a bombing, they all had either bombing interests or bombing experience with explosives. It, the one guy had already killed somebody. <laughs> it, uh, uh, the one guy told his family he was going there for one reason, for a job, they checked with the job, and in fact, he uh, they'd never even heard of him. They weren't hiring. Uh, so no one knows why he was uh, being on the flight. The other guy is on the flight with a gun. It's just, uh, it's, it, it's just, uh, I guess I, that to me, again, in part because even up here, nobody's heard of it. But to me, that's a case that really needs to be taught. Uh, and I, in my talks, I actually, I reference it and people have heard, haven't heard of it before. And even, if, you know, it's been, the U.S. or I was in Australia before the, the pandemic teaching there. Um, it, it really is, and that the, the chapter on it is just a slice of, of the talk, but yeah, when you have too many good suspects, how do you begin parsing them? And, 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 and what does your experience and, and, and common sense tell you? And what other offenders can you overlay? Because again, since then we've got so many, and this is the... Um, and basically the, the FBI's Mindhunter program is to build a brain trust of knowledge of why, how, what makes offenders tick, mass offenders or serial offenders. And we've got that body of knowledge now. And overlaying it onto that, that massacre um, that had no apparent motive, um, it, it becomes much easier for one suspect to end up. Yeah, that was an incredible story, and it was one that was completely new to us. Yeah, I'd, ne I'd never heard of that case before, but it was like, wow, that's that's a nightmare flight. No, but, yeah, exactly. That, that's a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, geez. And, like, I mean, we run into this all the time in, in, in the cases we cover sometimes, but it'll be like, you know, you, there'll be a case that happens, and then 
uh, turns out, you know, these three guys were all in the area and they all had motives and they were all pretty scary guys and had, you know, a propensity for violence. And, and I think that's, that becomes hard for people who are listening because they kind of, you know, they start just saying, Oh, well, it must've been this guy because he was in the area. And it's sort of like, it's like, you'd be surprised by how many really scary people can kind of come out of the woodwork through a case, but it, it doesn't mean that they're all guilty. Right. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, well, listen, it was it was delightful talking to you. Uh, where can people uh, get the book? Uh, just about anywhere uh, books are sold. Uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, obviously. Some neighborhood local bookshops may have it. Your airport bookstores, I'm told, may even be at Costco. And it piles them on a skid. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> but it gets books in the hands. Uh, it's a terrific book. We both really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, Kevin kept on uh, when he was, re- you know, when he was reading, he'd be like, "I think you were really preaching to the choir with both of us because we both we kept on being like, look at this, like <laughs> we <laughs> <Yeah>. agree." <laughs> well, that's great, and I appreciate you having me on. And uh, sounds like uh, you know, you your interest comes from an honest place, which is again what I'd like to see the, this current wave of true crime be more of. Yeah, it, it's because, I mean, I think I, I we have hope because I think a lot of, I mean, what I think there's a, a growing backlash to um, kind of the salacious nonsense and people are getting tired of seeing the same Ted Bundy documentary over and yeah. over again, which is good. Yeah, I'd like to think so. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks again, and uh, I'll come back anytime. Thank Amazing. you. We'll, we'll take you up on that. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> We would like to again thank Michael Arnfield for taking the time to talk with us about his book, How to Solve a Cold Case, and everything else he wanted to know about catching killers. We really enjoyed it. Remember, you can purchase it at your neighborhood bookstore, Amazon, or wherever else you buy books. To our surprise, we've gotten a number of requests from people saying they would like a way to help financially support our efforts with the show. So, if you are interested, we are relaunching a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. Join us there for two live video question and answer sessions each month. You can ask us anything, suggest new cases for us to look at, or even offer ideas for new leads for us to follow. If Patreon is not your thing, you can buy us a coffee at www dot buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on the Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>